Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Integrative Health Podcast with Dr. Jen. So I know it's been a bit, so we're going to come out with a bam, and we have Dr. Mark Sue here, and he is great. I have met him through different integrative functional medicine boards, and he's always so giving with information and his time. He is a board-certified family physician of 20 years. He founded Personal Care Physicians as a functional medicine practice north of Boston, and he did that in 2014 before it was even really big, and his also national virtual consulting practice, Functional Medicine Consulting Group. He founded that in 2021. He is currently serving as president of ISEAI, and is and we're going to talk about that later, and also a member of IFM, ILADS, and AAFP. Mark is driven to educate patients and empower them with choices in treatment planning. He is now equally driven to scale root cause medicine to help more patients get better faster, collaborating with like mission mind and colleagues, health coaches, and other allied health professionals. So super excited to have Mark on here today. And to get started, why don't you just tell everyone a little bit how you went from conventional family practice to starting this functional medicine practice that you have now? Yeah, sure. I think the, um, well, first, um, yeah, it's, thanks for the invite, Jen. It's, it's, it's fun. It's awesome. So I, it's awesome to see, you know, cause I don't do a podcast, so it's awesome that other people are making the effort and time to educate and empower and stuff like that. So it's, it's awesome. Um, but it's fun too. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I started practice out of residency in 2003. So I was employed by a couple different offices for like 11 and a half years. And, um, my, you know, just so, just so you know, or other people know that my background is, um, my dad was a drug researcher for Eli Lilly, right? So I grew up in Indianapolis. I come from no the way. back, but my mom and dad are from China and Taiwan where, you know, it's, it's a very different kind of thinking about health. So my dad, I remember my dad, um, I remember growing up, my dad's like in his office space in the house doing research for Lilly with an acupuncture needle in his pen, in his hand, you know, for his headache. So it's a it's a kind of a balanced I guess or diverse kind of background just in my upbringing, but um, really I think a lot of it is if I think the base of it is just um, I'm just wired I don't take any credit for it. I just I'm just wired to ask questions, <laughs> and um, and I guess that's the basis that you know you and I relate with and I'm sure a lot of you know people who you we rub shoulders with and patients who are people who you know uh, listen to your podcast and. It's just why, right? Like, why is that happening? And um, it's it's a lot of effort to be asking that question and digging and constantly learning, you know. But um, but if you, if I can't shut it off, which I, again I don't take credit for, it, then it's just there's always more to learn, and that's never going to stop. So, in my eleven and a half years in the two offices, um, you know, when I started being, you know, I think the contrast is it, my journey is not because of a chronic health issue for myself or a family member or something like that, which is a lot of our colleagues, right? Yeah. My journey is simply uh, as my own life coach therapist says, like, you know, I just am like genetically wired with empathy and on, on a level that I can't take credit for either. And so it's that empathy with the thirst for curiosity and why. And so, um, you know, when I was in my first practice of three years, when people would tell me who have fibromyalgia and would tell me, I know it's a virus with this head cold, but in the past when I'm given an antibiotic, my, my aches and pains get better. Would you please give me antibiotics? And I'm going, they're not scamming me of antibiotics. So what's that about? Right. And then enter the whole chronic Lyme story. So that was, that's kind of like the thing that kind of led into other journeys, but that's where I would leave it. Yes. And it makes so much sense that you know, you're asking why, you know, with, the, with the antibiotics and why do they make viruses feel better? And they do have that anti-inflammatory property. And like you said, sometimes it's undercovering a root cause. And I have found in medicine, doctors, they graduate medical school, they go to medical school because they're inquisitive. And then they leave medical school and in residency and they just, lose it. They lose all of that searching for answers. I don't know if they're burnout because I don't know, like you probably do this too. You see a complex patient, 
and you're asking those why questions so that leads you down a PubMed search and searching all your forums, you know, integrative and functional medicine colleague forums for an hour or two, because that will happen to me or, um, a patient will mention a different therapy. And I'm like, I don't know about that. I'm going to research the heck out of it and get back to you. So I think the problem is with conventional medicine is doctors are so strapped for RVUs and how many patients they see. And they're trying to pay back their student loans that they lose that wanting to learn more or they're strapped for protocols. Like look at the pandemic. What happened is these doctors working in hospitals, they were given the protocol and they could not move from it where enter FFL, FLCCC, they're asking questions, looking for answers that actually work. So for me, I really saw that the last five years, I would be sitting watching the news, watching you know the last two years of pandemic pan out, and I would be researching what I could like, there has to be a better way, there has to be a different way that works, and there is. But, but yeah, I, I, don't you sometimes wanna like scream at, people you trained with, because me, I just, I want to be like, why are you not asking questions? Why are you okay with treating, you know, pain with Motrin instead of looking for, to decrease their inflammation, you know, it's ruining their gut. And I don't know. I just, I get really passionate about it and it motivates me, but it's crazy, right? Like where, where did this go? What happened to doctors? Yeah, that's that's for another time. I, I I have a lot of thoughts on that. I'm sure we could you and I could network shop talk or whatever or whatever on that. But that's I have a lot of thoughts, and I I, I I'm I'm convicted that the far far majority of people who go into medicine, you know, do have a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, they have a they have a want to help people. I'm blanking on the term. Starts with an A. Um, yeah, they and now, um, yeah, they haven't they have a want to help people, but you know, the training, the system, as you said, the training, the system, the financial pressures, the the time pressures, all the system pressures. It's you know, like it's kind of like life, right? We just we get overwhelmed and deluded with so many things, and that that original passion has been modified, altered, or kind of buried, you know. And I don't even put judgment, emotional attachment around it. It's just it's just the nature of the beast. So I I'm always I'm just always so grateful for, you know, yourself and other practitioners we know who, um, you know, we, we, we hear or feel that call, but we don't ignore it. And, um, and that's not to be a jab on anybody else. Right. It's just, uh, cause it's not, everyone's got, you got to make your own decisions and, you know, we all have different circumstances, but for those of us who are, you know, those who answer the call and, and, you know, take that journey and take that step, it's, um, it's really meaningful for 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 us as practitioners just to support each other, but also for the the many hurting patients. So, yeah, you're right, and it is a calling, and it's not for everyone. I mean, my husband always talks about it. Is like, Jen, things were so much easier when you just worked full time in the ER, and now I have my own business, and I I do podcasts because I'm passionate. I want to get the word out, and I'm like, you're right, but I couldn't sit there and see the same patient over and over again in the ER who wasn't getting better with going to her primary care doctor every time. It's like the definition of insanity. So you're right. There shouldn't be judgment. And I try not to, I'm like, they just haven't like woken up yet. These doctors that are continuing, they're using pharmaceuticals. They're treating patients the same way. I just, I have to squeeze in someone that has POTS who sees this esteemed POTS expert in the area who put in a loop recorder and and I'm like, I know I can get her better. You know, she can get herself better. Actually, her body can heal, but they're stuck. And it's like, wouldn't you just like, as a doctor, just be like, oh my gosh, none of my patients feel better ever. Maybe something wrong. Maybe there's something else that works. Right. But, um, but it's this whole customer for life type stuff. Me, I want my patients to graduate and never see me and, you know, live their life. But I, this, this kind of gets us into the topic because I'm getting fired up. Um, let's talk about, um, and by the way, I, you, I wasn't, because I heard you say, you know, I try not to be judgment. Like it, hopefully that didn't come across as any kind of insinuation. Cause, um, that's no, not, you're good. Like, you don't, don't judge. You're good. Because I, sometimes I just get like, Ooh, but I'm getting better. I'm just like, they haven't, they haven't had that aha moment yet, but, but I've had colleagues I have um, two right now that are in the fellowship I did and they're loving it. They're at the um, Dr. Wiles fellowship. And I'm 
kind of helping mold them and shape them. And I'm going to give them business tips and everything that I did wrong with a business standpoint, I'm going to help them so they can flourish because it's what we need. So, um, so anyway, let's talk about the International Society for Environmental Acquired Illness. Sure. And you say that SI, how do you, how do you say that? Yeah, uh, ICI. ICI, that's it. I always want to make a word out of it. So this, how did you get involved? Because for those that don't know, this society is just really leading research and internationally conversations about environmental acquired illnesses. And this is what you see up there where, where you're at in the, the Northeast, right? Well, I mean, I think it's all of us, right? I, there's, um, I don't think of it as a geographic thing by any means, that's for sure. I mean, so- Oh, you know, Lyme. I was thinking Lyme, kind of. You're in Lyme country. Yeah, I, again, like- Now it's kind of everywhere, though. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, you, you were the original, ori the OG Lyme country. Yeah, that's at like least- Like Connecticut, my, Massachusetts. Paper. Yeah. yeah, on paper. Yeah. On paper, yeah. <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm from the Midwest originally, so I'm not, it's not like I would consider myself OG New England either, you know, but um, right. yeah, the organization started around 2000, um, well, I think maybe it's 2018 even, um, but the first conference was 2019. And um, how did I get involved in it? Well, so um, I was looking into, um, <clears throat> I was looking into the, I had a patient again. So um, I had a patient who asked me, hey, are you familiar with the know, Richard Shoemaker serves protocol for mold mold toxins. And, and I said, uh, very, very faintly, but he showed me some stuff he found online. He asked me to walk him through it. I was like, it's going to be really rough shot, but I'll, I'll do my best. And so we did it. And, um, you know, that went so far. And then coincidentally, I went to a conference in um, that. Yeah. I went to a conference, I forget, whatever, probably 2018 or early 2019. And um, there happened to be a presenter there um, from your state. You're in Cal, because I, yeah, a, um, a practitioner in California. Uh I'm in Ohio. Oh, well, for, for some reason, I thought you were in California. Um, so this I, I, I don't think I could. I don't think I'd survive in California. I'm we're, just kidding. We're, mid, we're Midwesterners. Yeah, we're Midwestern. Yeah, no, I'm in Ohio. I am a black sheep here, and um, that's why I, that's why I like Zoom. Most people I interview are from California. They're like, "Yeah, I'm in California." I'm like. Ohio Midwest. Where in the Midwest are you from? I'm from Indianapolis. Eli Lilly was headquartered there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Anyway, back on track. So, yeah, so this practitioner um, lectured on the SARS protocol and kind of got me, um, yes. you know, in that. And then we started um, putting that sort of uh, evaluation protocol into play and eyes wide open, you know, kind of like a, it was like, it was like the same experience as when we started um, testing people more specifically for you know, Lyme and tick-borne illness using the specialty labs more, you know, consistently. <clears throat> and then so, um, anyway, I, I, you know, I start to look into becoming a certified um, uh, surviving mold shoemaker protocol practitioner. And um, I go looking online at looking for somebody who was a certified practitioner, at, looking for tips, advice, pearls, et cetera. So I found um, Peg DiTulio, who's a nurse practitioner who's about eh, 40 minutes from where I'm at. And you know, she just has a special place in my heart because she just uh, she just took me under her wing, and we've you know we've become good friends, and we still meet most almost quarterly uh, with a group of people together, just chop talking and stuff, and learning and supporting each other. Um, but what happened was um, there was a group of practitioners who created this ICI organization, and she was on the board with them, and then she um, you know introduced me to that organization, and so um, yeah, so I was privileged to be aware of it early in its um, foundations, really early. And then, uh, I don't know, about a year into it, I don't know why, to be honest with you. I felt like I had no business being there at all, to be honest with you, but they, she was part of the board and they asked me if I wanted to be part of the board. Um, I thought it was just a great learning opportunity to be around other, you know, knowledgeable and authoritative kind of um, experienced practitioners in that world. And um, and so did that for whatever it was, year, year and a quarter, whatever. And then when they were turning over the board uh, leadership, again, don't know why. I don't didn't feel like I had any business being there. It's like deer in headlights, but they asked me um, to run for one of the executive leadership positions. So I did that and and that became the vice president role for a couple of years. And then um, 
as of uh, last November, December, you know, nine months ago or so, um, sipped into the present role. So, so that'll run two years and then we'll see from there. That's exciting. But, and yeah, I was just going to say, could you, for the listeners, explain what Sears is exactly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, SIRS is uh, CIRS is uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And so, you know, I think Richie Schumacher, I think, uh, deserves a lot, a lot of credit for, you know, um, kind of developing that space and the, all the research behind it and kind of standing in with all the um, naysayers for a lot, a lot of years. Right. But um, and so it's um the, the term specifically is just a it's just an, a chronic inflammatory condition. It's not actually by definition specific to a, a cause of it, but um, more or less it's highly associated with, at least in the surviving mold world, they'd say with water damaged buildings. And so everyone's thinking about mold, mold toxins, but by definition it's not specific to mold or mold toxins because as um, he suggested, proposed years ago, and now they have other data that's um, kind of more or less validated that <clears throat> those projections um, in a water damaged building, you know, mold or mold is only eight to 10% of the problem with the health of the water damaged building. And you got bacterial toxins that are like 23, 25% of the problem. And then these actinomycetes bacteria that are like 40 plus percent of the problem. So um, as far as causation of people having this chronic inflammatory condition. So mold, most people just think of SIRS as a mold, mold toxin issue. And uh, that's just because that's the history of a lot of this and the, the patient application. And um, that's where a lot of the um, clinical world has gone in direction, but it's it's branching further into those other two areas and even more beyond just mold, mold toxins. But that is, that's kind of like the bread and butter, you know, when, when we as practitioners or patients are reading about stuff and thinking about like, why am I sick and all that? Like we hear about mold, mold toxins all the time now. So. Yeah, it's becoming more common to discuss, but still in the Midwest, I mean, first of all, everyone looks like I'm crazy when I talk about it a little bit until I start to explain it. And then they're like, oh my goodness, that could be a problem. However, it's really hard. It's really hard to do the remediation. It causes a lot of stress, um, you know, financial stress, and then even getting someone that inspects properly. So we have one place that we use around here that I trust because the other ones I just they're they they just don't really know what they're doing so but it's it's really hard when people are kind of gaslit and they have all these symptoms and they are in this chronic inflammatory response situation and nothing really is going to work well and and if they're not detoxifying and their detox pathways, you know, aren't working well, they're not pooping well, anything that they try is just going to make them worse. So it's definitely important to make sure that they're getting the proper treatment and getting removed from the mold situation. I, I've seen that a lot. I don't know if you ever have people come to you that were never told they have to move away from the mold, that they're living in the mold and they're getting treated. And it's like, no, you got to, you, first step, you got to get out. So that's one thing that I find that is kind of hard. It is hard. I mean, it's actually, um, it's been a recurring topic for a lot of us, not, not just within ICI. Um, you know, one of the uh, board members is, uh, there's, we have two board members are, who are IEPs and um, Mike Schwanz and JW Biava right now, they're in Arizona and New Mexico respectively. And, um, you know, we did a, we did a, a Q and A or webinar with a bunch of IEPs actually. So, um, Peg Tulio and I, and then four IEPs did a webinar in February. I think it's February, early March. And then uh, another IP who's in ICI, Max McCord, and I did another one um, for a lab um, workshop thing in July. And um, this is a hot topic right now because you talk about gaslighting, right? The IEPs are regularly getting, on the flip side of what you just mentioned, the IEPs are regularly getting uh, clients who are told, like, you have to move. Like, they get some kind of test result, like a one-time thing, and all of a sudden it jumps from that to you got to move, you got mold all over, and whatever, blah blah blah. And so there's gaslighting on multiple levels, on different angles. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's interesting because I don't come across that story too much, where people are being treated and not being told like you got to look into your environment, and figure that out. But but you're absolutely right. It's right. it's a really complicated story because the person's got a complicated enough story and condition as it is, and then you double that with 
the the complexity of the um the health of the building and it's it's not one plus one is two it's like one plus one is three to three four five it's messy it's true and they, you're right they don't always have to move out they just need to get it remediated properly and found and a lot of the times it's in their work that's i have a lot of problems with that around here and sometimes they're awesome and they they're like yes there was a leak there is a problem like this one patient it was just his office was the only one being affected and they moved him and he's recovering well but it's it's really interesting the wide variety of symptoms someone could have from an environmental illness you know it could be anything from fatigue to a rash that won't go away you know lots of things digestion issues and that's why I think it's so important that, you know, we have these conversations so people know that it's not, their symptoms are for a reason. They, they need to find the root cause. So I guess talking about root cause, like what, when someone comes to you, to your office with a complaint, how do you kind of start digging? What, what do you, what do you do? What's your favorite, favorite thing to dig for? And, you know, how do you go about it? Well, um, our, our brick and mortar office is, um, we, we have like a low cost concierge practice. It's like 70 bucks a month and you know everyone has our text number and all that kind of stuff. And so um, I haven't really had, I don't, I rarely, rarely get new patients in the office. It's usually family members of people that, that can bypass the wait line, that kind of thing. But through our virtual practice, right, as you mentioned, the functional medicine consulting group, yeah, that's, that's like you know, constantly we're getting new people. And so let's put it in that framework. Okay. For those people, um, you know, we've landed, we've landed on a, um, a pro approach of, um, you know, that we've, we've kind of bantered on with the email form that we are on at least that one, if not more than one, um, where the approach is, um, and this wraps several of your sub, sub questions in there. The approach is we want to, to the extent that the patient will allow us, we'd rather do a lot of upfront work on testing to assess for a lot of problems all together at one time and figure out the big picture and the, the puzzle, figure out the roadmap to recovery rather than actually dig for one, one condition or like my favorite condition. In fact, I purposely intentionally try to take out my own biases of what I'm interested in, what makes me kind of simulated because, um, that's not necessary for me, the way I see it is it's, it's not necessarily the right answer for that patient. Right. So yeah, I'm, I may be sitting the role of the president of the ICI and sure. I mean, Hey, let's even say ICI doesn't even, it's not just about mold and mold toxins, right? It, it's a kind of a bread and butter sort of walk through the door face to the organization. But, you know, as the name kind of implies environmentally acquired illness, um, what, what are we talking about with environment? Sure. We could be talking about mold and mold toxins. Sure, we could talk about tick-borne illness from ticks. Sure, we could be talking about COVID from viruses. Sure, we could talk about like forest fires and you know all the stuff that comes from that or chemical spills. You know, I mean, you guys had that in Ohio last year with the train and or near Pennsylvania Ohio border. And you know, there's, we could the the list is endless, right? Um, and so that's where like, how do you how do I know? Just like you said, like the symptoms are so variable. How come that one guy in that one office is the only one being affected and the other however many people aren't, right? because it's not so straightforward as mold or mold toxins is affecting everybody on the same level. Why is that? Well, because there's a lot of reasons people have bug and toxins of different profiles for each person and different kinds of immune systems and different, all kinds of aspects about their health. It's like a, it's a big, um, you know, we call it the, um, we call it like, um, like breaking a code, cracking the code, right? Like mm. everyone's got a different code to crack to, to reach recovery. So, our approaches are actually to um, test for a lot of things at one time because we do see a lot of times we've all we've all been there. Patients who have been sick for like eight years. How many practitioners have they seen over eight years? How many labs have they done? How many how much money have they spent on how many visits? And a lot of us, myself included, there are certain topics that just they have a place in our heart, right? That it like was the groundbreaking thing that led us into functional medicine or something that like our family member had and we just have a special like emotional connection with it or it just as stimulating or whatever. But um, ultimately a lot of times 
you know, one practitioner is like looking into a couple things, another practitioner is looking into another couple things, and they just kind of revolve through the story. And then by the time you see them after like, you know, eight plus years or whatever, like they got a collection of stuff, but they're still sick. Right. And, and our goal is like, hey, let's let's try to figure out like what the various bugs and toxins are. You know, you can't, we can't find everything, but to the extent that we know as practitioners what the big dog players are. Let's take a look at what's going on with your immune system and your hormones and look at kind of everything and put together this whole map, what we call the three part map. And then um, with, you know, we talked about this before in the emails, the bugs and toxin profile, the self category profile with your hormones, immune system, nutrition factors, blah, blah, blah. And your third category of like where the self and the bugs and toxins are constantly interacting and causing inflammation by definition, which is mostly gut related. So it's kind of like this crude AI kind of approach, you know, and it's, it's kind of, it can be kind of overwhelming. It's very overwhelming for patients when we try to put it all together and explain it. But, um, but that's a long winded way of your, 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 when you ask like, how do you, what do you look for? What do you, how do you like to go about things to the extent that the patient will allow us, we'll look as widely as we can. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And there's a lot of different factors. So money can be a factor. So sometimes someone, you know, they, they're, they're coming, they can't afford 500 tests. So a lot of the times, like I try to work with what can we get, you know, testing with insurance and all of that. Sometimes it's some gestalt too. Um, where I'm at in the Midwest, usually patients just want just one test. Like that's all they can afford is as a gut test. So I'm trying to decide between organic acids and a mycotoxin versus a GI effects. And sometimes you can get a lot on their history. So definitely it, it can be difficult but yes, I, gosh, if, if people had an unlimited budget, I would just be like, let's get all the tests. Let's get them all. But when it comes down to it, gut health, really gut health is just where the money is and working and fixing on that, fixing that is important. Um, I'd like to backtrack and have you talk about how it's not just mold in a mold damaged building. Um, you brought up actinomyces. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, I mean, it's um, it's been talked about by uh, Dr. Shoemaker for a lot of years, but um, you know, I mean, I think it's only been definitely less than a year, maybe six months even. That um, I only know of one lab that even does testing for that. You know, whether environmentally or especially for for individuals for people. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a type of bacteria, kind of an uh, kind of a unique, unusual kind of bacteria um, on a scientific level. But nonetheless, um, yeah, it's just another bacteria that. Um, is part of environmental for part of environmental toxicity in a water damage building, and it's um, commonly found more in like the water systems, the pipe systems of homes. Not so much, not necessarily so much in the the walls and the um, the damp spaces of the the structure itself or the interstitial spaces of the of the buildings. So um, in some ways, the you know, and it's an evolving topic, right? So it's not like it's super well established yet, but um, so no doubt, you know, whenever, whenever things are evolving, then it's kind of like the carrots moving all the time. And so how we approach it, the thoughts around it, the schools of thought, the the paradigms, the evaluation process, the treatment process, the, it, it'll change, you know, kind of on a rapid pace over the next couple of years, I'm sure. But um, in some ways, I, I, I personally at this time think of it as it's not it's not as daunting of a topic as you might have to tear down walls and totally rebuild structure and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, um, from my, you know, limited sampling of um, either, you know, within our office experience with it or colleagues, you know, um, Peg Julio's, um, you know, had more patients working with that for sure than we have. Um, but uh, it looks like it's, it's more of a, okay, it may not be as costly and daunting of an effort necessarily than wall structure topics, but it doesn't go away you know, it's not as definitively addressable. So you kind of have to like repeat the, the treatment process multiple times. And then to give it, to make it sound even more, you know, to give you an idea of how, I guess to voice how complicated it can be. Now there's a question of, hey, how much of the actinomyces are actually originating in the, the building as a damaged building versus in people? And it's the poor hygiene of people and the lack of air circulation in the home because we're building all these, airtight homes to for for energy efficiency and it's the mm -hmm. poor hygiene poor circulation and the people are creating the actinomyces and then which is why we now can test people 
and we're just exuding it into our airspace in our homes and it's getting trapped in the homes and then it's feeding back on us. Talk about nuts yeah. there. So that's that's a very you know early evolving topic, but that's uh, the IPs are asking that kind of question these days. Yeah, that's really interesting. So they the, the IEPs they can test for that in the home certain certain ways. Okay, and yeah, then like, how do you eradicate it? Well, a lot of it's the a lot of it's cleaning processes, and I and I wouldn't pretend to be an authority on that or be able to speak to it um, as a wheelhouse topic. So, you know, that's where as as you as you alluded to earlier, like you know, having an IEP who knows their stuff is on a grand scale of things in the country, it's few and far between, right? And um, that's a big project that the IP, that um, ICI is growing and, and tackling right now is how to more mass scale train more IEPs who are so familiar with things beyond the standard commit. You know, we talk about conventional medicine and functional medicine, like it's the same thing going on with the IPs. It's just, it's kind of like a later, you know, delayed uh, growth curve right now, but um, we're kind of going through that same thing. Like how do we train more IPs about the same topics? beyond the conventional side and then um looking at um you know the ips ideally they're not the same people who are um remediating and cleaning right because conflict of interest conflict of stuff mm -hmm. but um yeah there's ways of testing and and cleaning and they make the recommendations for treating and then we retest and if it's not you know if it's not working out then we have to retest or re retreat retreat that's the general idea yeah and that's what is so crazy is like your house, you're in it so much, your work building. And if you're getting exposure to mold mycotoxins, if you're getting VOCs from the bacteria, the cinnamomyces, all of that, it's just, it could really just tip you over the edge. And that's when, you know, we talk about Lyme and gut dysbiosis, all of that. So it's, it's that tipping point and, you know, stress, we haven't talked about like just emotional stress and trauma and, Sometimes I feel feel like in the patients that just aren't getting better, that is just such a big part. And sometimes I struggle with that because sometimes people don't want to admit that they're super stressed out and it's affecting their health. Um, I know me, yeah, stress affects my health. I 100% can tell and have experienced it. So what have you found with with that and dealing with that? And if anyone's listening and they're super stressed out, how, how do they how do they work on that because it's such an important part of medicine of healing so that's a tough one i mean it is right um i mean especially in the mold mold toxin world um you know we call it you know the the the, the practitioner community term is the limbic system right or, or brain on fire so Mary Ackerley is a psychiatrist who is a co-founder of ICI. She's in Arizona. Uh, you know, brilliant mind, uh, has done a lot of work with all this stuff. And um, and she has a she has a well-known uh, web blog on that topic called Brain on Fire. As a psychiatrist, it kind of makes sense, right? But um, brain inflammation, right, is what we're talking about. And so how much of it is actually just what we call garden variety, mental, emotional, circumstantial, stress and sort of PTSD almost versus how much of it has actually chemical and metabolically caused inflammation actually driving that manifestation of feeling stressed. I mean, talk about getting even more complicated. So yeah, it's not an easy thing, but I think you alluded to um, the first step is um, as with most anything is awareness and recognition and admitting, right? And embracing that possibility and then coming to terms with it before you can actually take any action on it me um i don't know about you I'd be curious what you guys what you're doing these days but uh you know in the, in the mold mold toxin world a lot of people have um landed on uh, the annie hopper dnrs program and the gupta program as two probably the two big dog you know um, approaches um still not easy right i mean the dnrs thing is i've had a number of patients so, i mean you know, I, nothing's ever for me is like an emotional attachment meant to be one thing or another, but it, it's, it's, it's not trivial, right? The DNRS program, the DNRS program is, is not trivial. I've had a couple patients be able to do it on their own without going to an on-site conference and learning it for, you know, several days to a week. Um, but even those guys, and they're, they're like the warrior patients in my office who are like, they're 
execute go 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 and and sh sh this one particular she looked at me and was like if you have patients ever thinking about doing it on their own like they got to be ready and they got a clear space in their schedule and in their life and they got it it's it's not easy um the gupta program uh seems you know it's it's less costly it's less um it's less rigid if you will not to be taken the wrong way with dnrs but it's um but at the same time you got to be more accountable you, you're less accountable right so everyone's different right some people it works for them to work at home, work out at home. Other people they got to go to the gym because they're not making it happen at home, right? So everyone's different. You got to just find what works for you. My my new thing that I found from personal experience and um and now patients working with it is um, emotion code. And I won't get into it, but it's a whole other story. It's even for me because I'm I can be very analytical, no doubt, but um it's it's kind of woo woo, as yeah. colleagues say, right? It's kind of woo woo, but I, I can't I can't deny the uh, personal experience I had last year with um, a practitioner. So um, yeah, for the right patients, you know, there's just different tools, right? Basal, vagal, right. vagal, st vagal stimulation with various, whether acupuncture or different devices on Amazon or whatever else, there's all kinds of options, but the matter is like recognizing it and then deciding to strategize and figure out and then executing it and being able to have somebody support you, you know, yourself, like your patient's very fortunate to have you. Right. And a lot of our colleagues, like, we, we having somebody to just lead you and guide you and figure out what your best step is for that person. That's, that's the key in my mind. Yeah. And I, so I will recommend EMDR. So if, yeah. if it's a certain situational trauma, um, DNRS, if they think that they're not going to be so heavily triggered that they're safe doing it at home on their own. Um, yeah. Vagal nerve stimulation, you know, vibration type things that they can wear, wearable devices. Um, I mean, I, it's just, I have felt, you know, with the pandemic that a lot of us are emotionally dysregulated and don't feel safe. Um, so that, so that's been a little bit harder that I feel like everyone coming in now to my office, I'm like, okay, you know, on the questionnaire, do you have trauma? Yes, of course they do. We all do right mm -hmm. now. So, and we're all working on that. And I'm sure, you know, me personally, I know I have issues from what I saw in residency. I mean, I saw some stuff that I wouldn't wish upon anyone. And I know it affects my heart rate variability. So I've been trying some different wearables to, to work on that. So, and, and then I recommend, you know, prayer. I recommend, meditation with prayer and a lot, a lot of spiritual things, you know, with my patients too. Cause I think a lot of the times that that is really moves the needle also. So, you know, like you said, woo woo stuff. And it's like, not, not really, it's, it's all spiritual warfare. You know, if we want to talk about a lot of the stuff going on too. So I, you know, but with, with this in this limbic system, yes, if the brain's on fire, doesn't feel safe you're not going to, your body is not going to heal if you're running around from the bear. And I had to explain that to a patient today that she's in school and she's just can't concentrate, not studying, you know, well, and I'm like, well, because you're, you're, you're still emotionally dysregulated, your limbic system, you're still in fight or flight. So you're not going to like memorize a book you're reading if you think you're in danger. So we're working on that with her. Um, I think it is overwhelming though to patients. And my biggest thing I try when I sit down with a patient is to do little by little and say, you're doing a great job, you know? So, so what if you didn't do everything I suggested, you're not going to, you're going to just go at your own pace. So I think that's a really hard, hard thing to, to get, to get across because everyone just wants instant immediate results and that's not going to happen either. Absolutely especially with environmental stuff. So what do you think, um, you know, we talked about mold, illness, um, environmental toxins. What do you think about EMFs? Um, do you work a lot with, with that, with, you know, I know some people have homes that are completely wired, no Wi-Fi, and I'm just like, that'd be awesome, but not gonna happen, not gonna fly with my, my family. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, it's a, it's a hard, it's a really, really hard ask, right? Um, yeah. Um, as far as where I stand on that, um, you know, so, I mean, if we, if we open up, and I, by the way, I think we would, um, 
yeah, I'm sure you and I would connect a lot on the um, the the spiritual side of things, um, and you know how much we either personally or support patients or you know invite invite patients to consider or look into that um, you know on case by case basis, et cetera. Um, I'm sure. So, but staying in that realm, um, yeah. I, <clears throat> so um, I've added to my toolbox in the last couple of years um, energy and resonance testing as another form of data gathering. And so um, I bring that up because the analytical side of me goes any given topic, whether it's EMFs or COVID or Lyme or VOCs from a building or pesticides or whatever it is, like it, it's not that it's going to have the same impact on everybody, just like your example of the gentleman in the office. Right. And so the thing is, I, I have a hard time just making a blanket recommendation, especially when it has meaningful cost or effort involved or pragmatic consequences like Wi-Fi, like you said. Right. I'm not saying I'm not saying it's it's healthy and I'm dismissing it. But at the same time, I'm, I am convicted that it's going to affect it's going to affect some people more than others. And what I would love to be able to do, which is our nature of our training, is like, can you test for it or can you assess how much it's affecting one person versus another right because those if we could target and that's what a lot of research is about if you can target who is more affected by emfs and then have them make more effort to cut out wi-fi than everybody you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck in what we call that positive predictive value or whatever right so they're going to be benefiting a lot more whereas you get you ask everybody to cut out their wi-fi and you get a ton of people are like I don't know any difference. Like, why do I have to do that? You know? So I'm not in a place, you know, I guess going to your question, I'm not in a place where I'm making that a front burner thing and suggesting it to everybody because I don't really have a way to assess who's more affected than other affected than others. And I do know there are people out there and, you know, and I, I'm not even disagreeing with it. I just don't know enough right now who would argue that everybody's affecting, but affected by 5g. And I think there's likely reason for that. Right. I mean, there's a reason why we've got some, we got a practitioner in our office whose husband's a pilot and she's like, they're not allowed to put 5G towers within a certain radius of the airports. And my husband's like seen the airplanes have issues when they're around those 5G towers, like major problems. It's scary actually. And so why is that to say that that's not affecting humans or it's maybe supporting, you know, practitioners and colleagues I know who are making the argument like this is a real big problem. Okay. But I don't feel like, the uh, we as a population as a public is ready to accept that on a level where i'm just going to go out and say that to everybody right now where i can't i can't confidently substantiate that as how much is affecting one person or another yet so right. um, that's why for me when i do um, when i use the energy and resonance testing for a variety of topics i i put that into my my you know uh topics my wide variety of topics that i'm looking at but um it's yeah it's it's on the radar but it's not a it's not like a front burner topic right now yeah and i'll have patients reach out and they're like a 5g tower just went up by my kid's school and i can tell it's affecting them and oh, it's so it's so bad because i you, you can't like what can you do right i mean they have these like necklaces you can wear that supposedly change the change how it how it's moving and all those different yeah i mean it, so you so you believe so you think they work okay well you'll have to tell us what ones you have so that's one thing you know you can suggest that because it's not going to do harm someone wearing a necklace right and if it if it works awesome if it doesn't whatever you know i have some some like soma vedic like devices in my house in my office and to me it's just a peace of mind because these 5g towers are going up everywhere and the schools get a little extra money if they put them hmm. on their property and cities yeah it's it's really interesting my friend yeah so my friend their school district they were going to put one up and the citizens caught word of it they were going to put it right by the school and they're like no you're not um because they get they get a little extra money they're like if we put a 5g power on your property you you get some some kickbacks there so you have to really battle because they're incentivized by this but yeah tell us about your necklace well i mean it's a you know it's like a e-smog canceller um you know and, and so a colleague of mine uh his name is jeff has uh looked into a lot of this stuff there's a couple there's two or three colleagues i i lean on for this kind of information um who i think are really well balanced research it out um you know understand it much more than i do 
So, you know, I think just like you said, it's a, it's a compromise and balance to me, right? A couple hundred dollars or whatever for this, like, that's not a major deal. Like trying to figure out how to not have Wi-Fi in my house, that's a major deal. I, you know, we got four kids and my wife, like, I don't know how we would survive in day modern day America, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that's the, you know, the a defense to just neglect the topic. But look, I mean, to me, this is, this is not a high cost issue. I'm not like having to spend three hours a day trying to figure out something to address this topic. I just wear this thing for a couple hundred bucks. And then, yeah, we've got another device that we've now, you know, implemented to, for uh, EMF cancellation in our, you know, in our home and stuff like that. But do I know that it's making a difference? Like, that's the thing. Like I, the analytical part of my brain goes, I don't know. But like right. you said, I don't, I don't have any reason to think it's doing me harm. And I have enough reason to think there's potential harm. If it's not harming me now, then cumulatively over time, information or, you know, just the cumulative effect over time of EMS. So I'm just sort of doing my due diligence with uh, low risk. Yeah, exactly. And little things that I always tell people, put your Wi-Fi on a Christmas tree timer. It costs $3. So ours is off, you know, in the middle of the night from like midnight to seven. So that doesn't cost anything. Putting your plane in airplane mode. I mean, I had a patient and she was having a lot of anxiety at night and she was sleeping with her phone on right by her head. And I'm like, put it in airplane mode. Um, other little things. So what else could you do? Um Christmas tree timer, Wi-Fi. Those are the main like cheap tricks that I always tell people. Um, can't really do much about your neighbor's Wi-Fi, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, there's, a of, like, there's a bunch of like uh, canceling kind of devices, right? And then uh, the reason uh, Dr. Jeff was so um, much of a proponent of this one is because it's more of a proactive canceler instead of just a, a blocker that has more of a short range you know, um, but then I also know a company, um, I think they're called emfrocks.com. And so I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that I understand, you know, the science behind it, all that, and, you know, the validity or whatever, right. but Hey, to me, like 30, 60 bucks to, you know, for these rocks, like they look nice too. Like it's not a, it's not a, it's not asking a lot. Right. And yeah. So, I, I met the owner. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I was like, I was like, you sold me and they're under all of our beds. <laughs> and then yeah, I put exactly. like four of them in my husband's Tesla. Yeah, because exactly. Again, it's of like my husband has a Tesla, right? There's there's some yeah. data around this EMF stuff. I do, I do, I do um I'm a, I am convicted about some of the data. <clears throat> it's just I'm not ready to I'm not able right now. I shouldn't say ready. I'm not able to make it a blanket statement and be able to substantiate on a quantified level the way my analytical mind would like it to be. But I think, you know, over time it'll evolve. So right now it's on the radar for these bugs and toxins as a category. But um, like you said, like there's certain aspects we can, there's certain things in life we can have more control over and there's some things we can't. And it's the world we live in. It's a toxic world. It's getting more toxic. And so we do the best we can. And as you say, progress over perfection right? Yes. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And definitely toxic world. We're in a toxic soup. And that's why I tell my patients, you know, is that there's just toxins everywhere. So we're going to find the best way for your body to deal with those toxins. And some, some people have less tools, right? Or they're just, their armor has been taken away from like bugs, environmental stuff or genetics. Sometimes people just don't methylate as well. So, and that's the thing, everyone is totally different. That's yep. the cool thing, but it, it makes our job challenging, but a good challenge, right? Yeah. I mean, like I said, like we look at it as like a code to create. Everyone's got a different code, right? And if, you yeah. if, you're not, if you're not, at least if you're not symptomatically or known to be sick, then great. You still have a code, but you just don't feel the problems, the effects of it. But everyone's code is different. Or, you know, actually, I would argue that uh, um it's not even we have one code. There's there's multiple codes that'll work, if you will. But um, but anyway, yeah. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, factors involved in why everyone has a different profile. Oh, it's I love that analogy. It's complicated. Yeah. That's it's 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 interesting and challenging and stimulating, but it kind of sucks too. Right. Yeah, it does. All right, let me ask you, what is your favorite book that you've read lately? I've been really just trying to read like a couple books a month. So any good ones? Do you even have time to read a book? I, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I, I, 
I would love to read more. I gave up on books years ago because I just kept asking for them for my birthday or Christmas or whatever. And then I just had this cabinet full of books I wasn't getting to. Um, the book that's on my, um, that's a great question. The book that's on my um, chair that I've swapped books with a patient with is um, the biography, the autobiography of, uh, of Bono. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, right above my, on my wall right here, I've got <clears throat> four, <clears throat> four photos <clears throat> that are kind of like heroes in my life. One of them is a, um, a real close friend of my wife and I's, um, she and her husband are probably our closest friends as couples and she died in her sleep um, a year and a year and a quarter ago. You're, you're almost, I'm sorry, almost. Yeah, it was Thanksgiving weekend. Um, so anyway, she's, she's just such a, such a um, meaningful person in our lives. So when I put that picture up, I put three other pictures and it's um, Bono, Martin Luther King Jr. and Greg Popovich. Most people probably don't know Greg Popovich, but he's the uh, head coach of the San Antonio Spurs. And um, yeah. weirdly, fortunately, had the run in, run in with at a restaurant in Maine one time. I won't get into that, but you know they're they're heroes to me because because um, <clears throat> I I'm a big um, justice is a big value for me, and uh, these guys um, you know I mean I don't know I know somebody who knows Bono actually and they're like yeah they put a lot of money into Africa and they they do a lot of um, advocacy you know financially and economically politically and all that stuff but um, you know uh, behind the curtains it's you know, nobody's perfect let's just say right nobody's perfect and you everyone can be judged and everybody can be criticized because nobody's perfect and everyone's got relative standards but in my eyes like i get a lot of inspiration for these three people that's what i'll say a lot of inspiration and uh, the autobiography of martin luther king jr by something clayton i think at first name both see both first and last names are c's that book is a life life game changer for me too nice okay awesome i'll have to add those to my list to read so Mark, how can everyone find you? Do, you? do you hang out on social media or you're just working at your office a lot, right? So where can they find you? On the forums? Um, I, I sort of have like a resume website, if you will. Just my, it's just drmarksu.com. You know, it's, it's more like a just kind of like a placeholder. Just um, I, I sort of like I use it as an online resume, literally. Um, That's but yeah, emails, I'm, I'm able to be contacted there. And then, um, yeah, I mean, oh, I should I should mention as a it's not really for plug as much as it is just for everybody's information. So ICI, right, the organ it's I-S-E-A-I dot org. Um, going back to the mold mold toxin topic, um, if you go under the get help tab and then under there, I think it's under resources. Um, there's a couple of um, free um, brochures um, that the IEP committee has put together have been greatly meaningfully downloaded in great numbers just in the last few months that since they've been put out, but they're really, really helpful for people in terms of their home, like, you know, what to watch out for with, if you will, like scammers or people just kind of like rake, mm -hmm. looking rake over with the, uh, the home remediation inspection and all that stuff, as well as like, um, you know, do you have to move or um, like, what do you, I don't think that that third document's out yet, but it will be about, um, if you're moving, you know, from a mold home to somewhere else, like what should you take or not take that kind of stuff? Like what do you need to be careful about that might still have mold, mold toxins on it? So helpful, yes. A lot, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of useful info that everyone's asking all the time, both as practitioners and as patients. So that's a really yeah. informative download of resources there too. Yes, and I will link that in the show notes for everyone, all of the websites and everything. So that's awesome. That will be so helpful. And thank you so much for spending your time out of your busy day to educate and share your knowledge. That's fun. That's fun to, like I said, yeah, it's fun. And this this stuff fuels me, right? Because, I mean, what we do is not easy. And that's not to be like, you know, pity us or what anything. We, we choose to do this, but it's not easy. And uh, when we have those when we when we get to journey with a patient, they like have such a great win. Like I tell people, like they're so thankful, they're crying, I'm crying, but I'm like, I'm crying because you have no idea. I legitimately am telling you, you just fueled me for the next four to six months. Your one story has carried me for the next four to six months. So thank you. You know, it's not easy. That's true. That's so amazing. Thank you so much, Mark.